Hey, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Negotiation, part two of our conversation with Zach Dykwald, founder and CEO of Young China Group, a think tank and consultancy with a focus on the emerging influence of China's millennial generation on the marketplace, workplace, and international politics. We discuss how brands can be successful among the millennial and Gen Z cohort, the major events that have shaped China's millennials, the prevalence of conspicuous consumption in the life of the average 25 to 30 year old in China, the makeup of a good brand in China today, and whether millennials in China are environmentally conscious and the level of their focus on diversity, equity and inclusion. Enjoy. The Atlanta Olympics, they remember seeing the United States won 40 plus gold medals. And that year, China won 15 or 16. They remember seeing the United States. They remember their parents sort of telling them, wow, that's the United States is the city on the hill. That's the nation towards which we aspire. You fast forward to 2008 and you're watching China win 40 plus gold medals and you're watching the United States win 36. And we cover the Beijing Olympics, especially that opening ceremony as this triumph, as, as, as China beating its chest and announcing to the rest of the world that we are modern, we are strong, we are powerful, we are coordinated, and we're striving towards the future. Home to over 4 billion people, the Asia-Pacific region boasts one of the most powerful consumer markets on the planet. Not only is it home to half the world's under 30 population, but it's also home to more than half the world's internet users. It's a market no globally minded brand should ignore, but entering markets like China is no easy task. Just ask the likes of Microsoft, Google, Uber, and Facebook. Times are changing, and with the right partners, doors are slowly opening as more and more companies find success expanding into the markets of the Middle Kingdom. I myself spent eight years in China, mostly as a venture capitalist, helping early-stage tech companies enter the Asia-Pacific market successfully. This show is dedicated to uncovering and examining successful China entry and growth strategies by interviewing the people behind those success stories. My name is Todd Embley, and welcome to The Negotiation, brought to you by WPIC Marketing and Technology. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to part two of our recording with Zach Dykewald. We're going to jump right back into the conversation, Zach. What are a few key points that you recommend to brands that are looking to succeed in China among the millennial and Gen Z cohort? On this podcast, as listeners will know, we often talk about what Western brands need to do to succeed in the market and the mistakes that are made by others. From your vantage point, what comes to mind when thinking about the winners versus the rest of the pack? The thing that comes to mind first is obvious, but hard to do. So I'm going to say it, and then I'm going to try to provide a little bit more substance and and some more meat about actually how to do it. Um, So the first thing that comes to mind is is to empower your local Chinese team to drive strategy. One of the really difficult parts of, of local Chinese teams when they're working at multinationals is that they're hired because they're really good at something. But a lot of their job description ends up being having to describe what they're doing, why they're doing it what the Chinese sort of information ecosystem looks like, what are the key players in, in, in sort of multimedia. They have to do sort of that teaching back to headquarters in order to get approved for budget, in order to move forward on projects, in order to make sure that sort of the bosses back home feel like they know what's going on. The difficulty of that is it means that they're always going to be moving slower than local teams with local, with local executives who understand intuitively what the local market looks like. And so there's a little bit more of a leap of faith than most sort of headquarters that I've spoken with and and executives back, you know, in in Europe or the United States or Latin America who always want to be knowing what's happening in China. Um, You have to weigh that against the ability for your China team to actually be effective, nimble and capable with their strategy on the ground. So the, the broad umbrella here is empower the heck out of your local China team and do it so that they can be fast enough to compete with local brands. The backdrop being that it's no longer enough to just be foreign. Um, Of course, it used to be in China, being foreign was equated with being better, higher quality, better service. That Those days are gone. And so you're also competing with communicating with your customer in a way that you used to have sort of a bit of a handicap that was granted to you because you're you're foreign and, and therefore higher quality. That handicap is being removed. So empower your China team. The second point that comes to mind, Todd, is, is stop, stop creating products and thinking about marketing to tier one cities. There's this conception of how you segment the market in China that, that often orbits around city tiers. And the problem with the city tier visual is that we imagine trends 
cascading downwards from tier one. So what's happening in Shanghai is going to be impacting what's happening in Chengdu, which could be impacting what's happening in Diliang, um, which is outside of Chengdu, uh, smaller city, uh, in, in sort of like the satellite area of Sichuan, um, which, which will be happening in sort of smaller cities in Guizhou or like whatever it is. There, there's this feeling that what happens in, in tier one will cascade down. And, and that's not necessarily the case. And I think it's, I think it's a little bit of linguistic determinism. I think it's a fault of the tiered idea. Uh, so if, if you're imagining like, a, like one of these chocolate fountains or whatever, a trend fountain, whatever happens in tier one will cascade downwards. It's not necessarily trickle down trends. So looking and recognizing that trends for the rest of, of China, you know, we talk a lot about the, the Shaftan markets, the, the sort of it's translated to sunken markets. A, I hate that translation. Lower markets uh, is, is also a not particularly kind translation, but typically tiers three through five and then rural China. Recognizing that there are trends that are created by and for those tiers that don't originate in tier one cities will, will give you a, a head start against other global brands whose thinking is still mired in that sort of Shanghai bubble. So both of those two would be what I would focus on. Uh, first one, empowering your China team in a, in a real way. And recognize you're not doing it to be nice. You're doing it so they can run with local competition uh, at that speed. And second would be recognizing that that trends do not cascade down from tier one down to tier five. And rather, there, there's far more you know, for us, by us, created in tier three, for tier three sort of thinking. That means that you have to be basing your, your thought and, and, and getting your sort of inputs outside of the Shanghai China headquarters. I want to talk a little bit about major events that may have affected or impacted the mindset and habits of millennials in China. In the US, in Canada, in, in, in the West, we know things like the Great Was that we know things like the Great Recession, above all else, and in the coming years we'll probably be seeing the full effects and talking about the pandemic. But what about in China? What have been the major events for young people there? Any any shockwaves or impacts that have been noted? So there's there's three that come to mind that sort of burst burst to pop of mind immediately. The first one is Tiananmen, but it's not for the reasons you expect. What happened after Tiananmen uh, was a restructuring of Chinese education, of national education. So national education before Tiananmen Square was organized around modern China. Modern China being 1949 onwards. It was about how great Mao was. You know, there's the famous Hessler example of, uh, you know, government sort of negotiating. Uh, well, now Mao was 70% right and 30% wrong or 80% right or 20% wrong. And, but it was really focused on, on modern China and those accomplishments. Um, after Tiananmen, that wasn't fully scrapped, but it was contextualized in a larger uh, Chinese history. So China basically reclaimed its full history. When you think of the 5,000 years of history, that was rewritten into the history books in a material way. And the reason that's so important is because this young generation was the first generation to really get that education. And it set the stage for this, this fu xing idea, right? This return. What China is now doing is a return to power and status. Because the older generations in, in China were really taught that, okay, China is, we're, we're, we're coming out of these sort of communist roots and entering into the world that way, this younger generation in China was taught, okay, we used to be the strongest empire on earth. That is our history. We fell to our knees in part because of our own failures to recognize that the rest of the world was modernizing and catching up. And in part because of foreign aggression. And now we are returning. So there's this sense of, of predestination, China, not just rising to power, but returning to power, which was a narrative that was shifted in the early nineties that has a huge impact on honestly modern sort of government uh, narratives, as well as truly what these young people have feel like they've seen and witnessed in their entire lives. It's not, it's not a surprise that China is returning. They're returning to their, their natural place, uh, which is, which is powerful. You know, Carl Jung talks about uh, in personal psychology, he talks about how we all have our own myths, right? It's, it's less important, Todd, like what you and I act, what actually happened in our lives. And it's more important that the story that we tell ourselves about our lives, the myth of our own lives. Maybe there was like a swim meet when you were young that really defined your, your ability to be courageous. And, and you put a lot of 
an emphasis on that. And okay, now I'm a courageous person years on because of that event. And it's probably a little bit disproportionate emphasis, but, but it's those stories that create our sense of self. Similarly, our history books, you know, the, the stories that nations tell their young people about who they are, plays a really big role in, in that sense of self as they grow up. And so for those of you who are trying to understand the, the guochao, like the, the, the sort of the Chinese, you know, this, people, people translate it as like nationalist buying. I, I don't think that's a good translation. But this increasing sense of pride with this young generation, it started with a shift in education post Tiananmen. So that's number one. Number two would be the Olympics. And again, it's not for the reasons you think. So when we talk about the Beijing Olympics in 08, if you're born in 1990, uh, 08, you'd be 18. I want to take you back to 1996. So 1996, obviously, you'd be six years old. Uh, I've talked with a lot of people who, who think of the Atlanta Olympics in 1996 as their first real memory of seeing the outside world in a real way. Remember in like 1993 is when the first McDonald's and KFC started to come into China. And so that, I mean, that's when people started to interact with foreign food in a real way. It's when, it's when China was becoming increasingly um, exposed to the outside world in, in really tiny increments. Um, and the Atlanta Olympics, they remember seeing, I think the United States won 40 plus gold medals. And that year, China won 15 or 16. And they remember seeing the United States. They remember their parents sort of telling them, wow, that's the United States is the city on the hill. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the nation towards which we aspire. You fast forward to 2008. And so from six to 18, and you're watching China win 40 plus gold medals. And you're watching the United States win 36. And we cover the Beijing Olympics, especially that opening ceremony, as this triumph, as, as, as China beating its chest and announcing to the rest of the world that we are modern, we are strong, we are powerful, we are coordinated, and we're striving towards the future. What we're missing in that narrative is it was as much an announcement to China, especially the older generations in China, that this is a new China. We are not the weak China of your childhood. We are not the uh, aspiring China of, of the 80s and 90s. We are now on, uh, on a level of global power and coordination that's real. And, and that redefinition, particularly for the older generations in China who grew up in real and deep poverty, you know, in the last, in the last podcast, we talked about the importance of intergenerations and, and understanding the parents of this young generation. The parents of this young generation grew up with a bit of a chip on their shoulder about China standing in this world. This young generation has grown up, again, consistent with that sort of reimagining of education, with this narrative that China is, is not just on the rise, but on the return. And the Beijing Olympics was not just a, an announcement to the rest of the world, but an announcement to the entire country that China is not the China of your childhood. We are entering a new era. The third one that comes to mind, late 2012, uh, Xi Jinping made his first and famous anti-corruption campaign announcement. He said, if you want to be a rich, do not become uh, a party cadre. And if you are rich and you are in the party, then you're doing something wrong. I think he made the speech at Peking University. And again, the anti-corruption, there's a little, a little bit of a theme alert here. It's an important date and it's an important event, not for the ideas that you necessarily would think. When we talk about anti-corruption on the outside, we often talk about it as power jockeying at the top. You know, Xi Jinping trying to consolidate power so that he could, you know, have a hold and 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 you know extend his rule and and whatnot. So it was in the in the it was called catching tigers and swatting flies. We really focus on the tigers, the people who are at the top uh, of 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 the party uh, and Xi Jinping's efforts to consolidate power. What we miss is. Is the, is the flies. For the vast majority of people in China before 2012, and there's great Pew data to back this up, the number one element that was controlling their lives and their ability to get ahead was the feeling of corrupt officials. And let's make that real. It was the feeling that you had to spend half of your startup costs on cigarettes and booze if you wanted to start a factory or a store. It was a feeling if you didn't know a guy and didn't know the right guy or didn't you know, bribe the right guy, your kid wouldn't be able to get into a good college. It was a feeling if you didn't have access to the back doors, you'd never be able to enter through the front. The feeling that China was not a meritocracy. 
because it used to be that the best jobs in China were government. It was, you know, the iron rice bowl in the 80s and 90s. It, it was never going to make you rich, but the rice bowl wouldn't break. It was the best job you could have. And then it was the golden rice bowl in the early 2000s, uh, all the way up through the very beginning, you know, 2010 era. Um, and the feeling that you could become incredibly rich because if you had sort of a cousin who was working in government and you had a nail factory and they had to do a, you know, a huge infrastructure project, that, that contract could come your way and then you could both get really rich. So the anti-corruption campaign was a huge signal towards meritocracy for the country. Now we could argue that, you know, it was just posturing and, and, you know, it was just a political move, but the feeling in China was no longer gosh, I want to work hard so I can become, so I can work in government. It was, gosh, I want to work hard because there's a real chance that I can get ahead, that I could change my lot in life. And there's an impulse to trivialize that from the outside. But when we do interviews on the ground in China, um, from 2012 onwards, there is a real feeling that there was palpable change from the anti-corruption campaign and that it shifted the country towards private industry away from government jobs, away from state-owned enterprises, and even away from, from, you know, the government is now challenged because trying to get good talent into government positions, matriculating in government positions, is actually harder because it's no longer an aspirational job in the way that it used to be. So those, those three come to mind, the, the shifting of the education campaign post Tiananmen towards something that, that characterizes China as a return to power, a return to global stature, the Beijing Olympics, because it, it recharacterized the country, it rebranded the country, not for the international community, but for Chinese people themselves, especially the older generation who grew up with China as a weak nation, not as the strong nation that China was telling the country that they are now. And then the, the first sort of speech announcing the anti-corruption campaign uh, and, and what that would mean, because it was a signal to the country that there is a real pivot towards meritocracy. And even though it's been trivialized on the outside, it's felt it's been felt on the ground in China in real tangible ways. Could you break down the difference in millennials from those that are mainlanders and have always grown up in the mainland versus those that many listeners may have met that are abroad or study abroad or traveled abroad? You have to remember that there's only 10 percent of the Chinese population that has a passport. And so for all of you who are who are basing a lot of your opinions on China, on sort of the global, you know, maybe maybe your colleagues at your office, people who have spent extensive times abroad, you have to remember that that's a massive availability bias, which is to say that the people that you are meeting are often more the exception than the rule. And, and so that's just one thing to keep in mind that I'm not saying what, what you're experiencing was actually the exception for that community. Um, but one of, the, one of the major themes we hear when we talk with study abroad students is just like, it's not the 1990s anymore. So in the 1990s, if you had a job offer from the United States, if you were trying to trying to emigrate from, from China to the US, you were, you were an economic refugee. China's per capita GDP in 1990 was around 300 bucks, a little bit less. Versus today, it's over 10,000. And, and so it's not, by the way, the United States is still six times that. Um, but what you're realizing is there's more parity. There's more opportunity parity. There's more... A purchasing power parity, which is to say that people feel like they can live a higher quality of life at home with the language they know, um, with fewer barriers to advancing. You know, one of the great kind of tragedies of, of study abroad turned employees and, 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 and white collar workers in the United States is they feel like they hit, which is sort of unfortunately named the, the bamboo ceiling, the feeling that, you know, Chinese kids are great analysts, but bad managers. They're not going to run into that at home. Uh, plus, they're going to be closer to their family. They're going to miss the food. I mean, you're getting much less of the developing country. U.S. is this incredible opportunity that we can never attain back home mentality that drove a lot of immigration to the United States from China in the 70s, 80s and 90s. That's over. And, and it's not to say that people don't want to come and stay here. They do. And some people do. But it's not just a given anymore. And then when you add all of these sort of government, the, the sort of regulatory climate that's in, that's encouraging these these talents, these foreign talents is the or excuse me, this national talents with study abroad experience. I mean, it's an attractive. They're making it attractive to go back to China at a time where we're making it hard to stay in the United States. So many people are choosing it. And yes, part of it is the sort of like family guanxi infrastructure that you have back home. 
better jobs, better opportunities, maybe 20,000 RMB a month, which of course goes a lot further in, in Shanghai than New York, although it's more comparable in Shanghai than, than any other Chinese city. Um, but you also get the entire sort of support system um, as well as, a, as an ecosystem that you can navigate better. Um, that, that could be better for you in building your life, your career, finding a family, et cetera. How prevalent is conspicuous consumption in the life of the average 25 or 30 year old Chinese individual? Relative term, the answer is less, but not compared to Americans. It's more than, it's more than young people in America. It's less than, than the older generation. The, old, the older generation was primarily consuming in a sort of like the bigger, the Gucci belt, the better sort of idea which is you'd get these brands that everyone knew exactly how much everything cost. And then you'd wear them in, in the most obvious way possible. It was, a, it was a way to socially posture, particularly around wealth and class. What you have now is conspicuous consumption oriented more towards brand tribes and identity. So if you think like 1960s US, um, a smarter marketer uh, br- brought this corollary to, to, to light for me. And sort of like the Ralph Lauren era where, where that sort of logo represent an entire lifestyle. Um, the brand tribes you're seeing right now, to me, are really symptoms of, of young people who are trying to find a sense of self in, in incredibly, um, I guess, personally nullifying uh, large Chinese cities uh, and, and at the tail end of, of the Chinese education system. So I mean, this, is, this young generation is known as the me generation in, in China. Um, they're far more about themselves. Part of that is demography. Part of that is just the way that the world moves. Um, and so this question of how do I define myself, often brands are used to, to associate themselves with a subculture and a niche um, rather than just saying, I have money, my family has money, we have power, be nice to me, which is the old style of consumption. I want to talk a little bit about what they are like now as, as consumers. Let's start with with brands. What brands they like and dislike and why? Increasingly national is my short answer. And the reason is, again, these are relative terms. For the older generation, it used to be that foreign meant better. For the younger generation who's grown up less uh, with less of a sort of inferiority complex around that, they don't have the baggage. And so national brands often have a better understanding of their tastes, often can speak to them the way that they want. They're often meeting them where they go. Remember that young people in China are using their phones about two times as much as young people in the United States, a full 2X. So so it's not to say that there isn't space for global brands. There is. But global brands are no longer better because they're foreign. What's driving that? Is there a national push? Is there better transparency? Is there more intuitive uh, intelligence in what makes a good brand versus what doesn't? What would you say is driving that? First, national brands know national consumers better. Second, global brands usually have crap China fitness. And I say that lovingly, which is to say that, in a, and we, we run up against this in a lot. We do a lot of equity research focusing on, on brands that, are, that have China as a component of their consumer strategy. And I mean, what you see consistently is a global team who basically checks a box or two on their China digital strategy. And so you get this patchwork of, of effort in, in the digital space by somebody whose digital world is Instagram, TikTok, maybe, and, and sort of Facebook and, and Spotify and whatever versus the local ecosystem. And so you have global brands who just can't keep up with, with national brands. Uh, third, the product is really good. It's no longer an era where, where like a Chinese phone is inherently worse than an American one. Product has gotten better. And fourth, there is real nationalism happening, which is to say that the last couple of years of increasingly negative, sometimes deserved, sometimes not, China rhetoric is fanning the flames of, of real nationalism in China. Those, I mean, th- that those flames are being absolutely just blown out of proportion by the Chinese government and the propaganda core back home. Is there an appreciation for great design? So I'm going to say pass on this in that I don't have an example um, that I feel like could stand up to the to sort of the acid test of real product people who who have a better eye for that than me. I will say that there is a, a, a huge and increasing attention to quality, um, particularly in first tier cities. I know I said the tier system matters less. Um, it, it matters a lot when you think about styles of consumption. 
and because there's there's a there's a lot of China for whom high quality is is not important. I think of sort of the Pinduoduo crowd, which is which is a market that so many global global companies just more or less ignore. But for the more high end market, you definitely are seeing Chinese products that are that are meeting the needs of uh, of a young generation who doesn't want fake stuff. Again, separating from sort of like the upper tiers of society who doesn't want fake stuff and lower tiers who just wants modern stuff. Fake or not, they don't care. What about media? You know, like you said, they're on their phones twice as much as uh, their compatriots in the U.S., for for example. Obviously, a tremendous amount of media flowing in and out of those eyeballs. What, what kind of media are they consuming? Where? What platforms? What styles of media are, are, are they consuming? And maybe what are they avoiding and not consuming and why? Right. So uh, first, your quantity, enormous. Major has um, had some interesting numbers about the you know comparing millennial uh, phone usage and and sort of online engagement, even willingness to sort of define who they are online versus offline. And the general outcome is that young people in China are spending twice as much time on their phones in pretty much every capacity. Um, so first headline, lot more. Second, um, fragmented. I think one of the more defining characteristics of of the U.S. and Western Europe's sort of social online ecosystem is that there's only a couple major players. China has far more. And even sort of like the food apps and the streaming apps are fully socially integrated. Um, and so the, the sort of blend of social and commerce um, uh, and entertainment is, is far ahead of what we have in the United States. I would also say that we might never get there because there, there's a consumer in China who, again, is far more willing to, to engage on that level online. Um, and so, I mean, the unsatisfactory answer is that it's more fragmented and harder to know. And so this is really a space where you need sort of a jungle guide. I don't believe that there are any global organizations that can know as intimately the local digital ecosystem, as well as a Chinese company or a global company with an extremely robust and very well empowered local team. How socially slash environmentally conscious are millennials in China now? Right. So these are all relative terms. So I'm going to say more. So when I say more, though, um, they're, they're more than their parents and less than Western millennials. Um, they're, they're, are they going to stop using plastic straws because, because of whales in the ocean? No. Do they care a lot about pollution in their cities? Uh, yes. And so these 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 uh, climate issues that impact their life directly are, are higher on the docket of importance. Um, and you have a younger generation who is also increasingly aware of the more abstract but globally impactful climate considerations and China's role in them. Maybe we can quickly touch on DEI, diversity, equality, and inclusion. What is their you know, China's youth fitness around DEI and what is kind of helping mold, shape, move, create friction. Is there, um, is that an added tectonic plate for some with regards to the family dynamic, the social dynamic, you know, and so on. And maybe you could touch a little bit on DEI, uh, and China's youth. Yeah. So, so China is, is relatively monoethnic, at least proportionally 90% Han Chinese. And so, a lot of, well, for, for a Western audience, a lot of where we come, come at from DEI is from our own shit. And I don't, I don't, am I allowed to say that? I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but our own baggage. I mean, we, we have a, a twisted relationship with race that's based on our twisted, our twisted history around this. And, and so often the difficulty is we, we try to sort of bring that framework to looking at China and China has a different relationship with race. It's not better. Um, but it's, it's, it's twisted in different directions, if you will. And so a lot of the questions around race, most people in China don't even know to ask them. It's so outside of their experience. It's not malice, it's ignorance. It's not something that they deal with on a daily basis. Gender is, is something that's far more on, on people's minds. Um, and I think, I think you're getting an increasing awareness of uh, how to overcome traditional attitudes, particularly towards women in the workplace. I mean, that's, that's really where it probably comes up the most for, for large companies. 
Because women in the past were, you know, actually during Mao's China, this, this whole people always kind of bought this as, a, as, as proof that Mao is a feminist. Women hold up half the sky. Mao wasn't a feminist. He was a pragmatist uh, because he had an enormous population who wasn't particularly productive. And he realized by putting women to work alongside men that, they, that he could create an entire economic revolution. And he did. Um, well, he did it, but it was, it, it's, what, it's what paved the way later on for, for women working in factories in what was otherwise a relatively traditional gender-rolled society within China. Um, but it's totally what helped build China's modern economy was that women, women were asked and, and, and answered uh, to work in the workforce. Um, but then that, that pragmatism sort of breaks down because China often is asking these women to also marry. So they're going through the education system. Uh, work as hard as they can. And then if they're 27, 28 and not married, then they're called leftover women, and sort of abandoned by the system that was pushing them to get educated and go to work. Um, but what you're seeing now is this young generation is pushing back against that. Um, it's not pushing back against that wholesale. And yes, there are, there are protests throughout the country, relatively small in scale and, and less impactful, frankly, than, than we'd like to think. And certainly that, that our coverage sort of would suggest. But there is far more flexibility and pliability around these, the binds of tradition around what it means to be a good woman, a good daughter, a good wife, a good spouse. And um, so to take a step back, I mean, these issues around DEI, they're, they're, the issues that are on people's minds are the ones that disproportionately affect China, just as the issues that are you know, most important to Americans are the ones that that our history has has forced us to emphasize in modernity. So in China, it's more around gender roles than it is around race. Obviously, I don't want to elide or, or erase um, some of the really important uh, issues around race and religion that are happening in China right now. But particularly in the workplace, gender is where DEI often um, comes to the forefront of conversation. And there does seem to be palpable shifts and at least real conversations in the workplace, although it's far from perfect. We have to talk about your book, Young China, How the Restless Generation Will Change Their Country and the World. Please introduce it and what the main thesis is and how will this generation change their country and the world? Gosh, yeah. So, so Young China, I started writing Young China when I was 24. And the idea behind it was when, when we look at China, we often focus on old stereotypes. Um, past generations, a really government-oriented perspective, um, because that's often what's written about in the media. And I felt like I was fighting against, or I was, I was hoping to sort of fight against really extreme views of China. Because often when we talk about China, we talk about um, the most exceptional cases. You have sort of these super rich, super poor, like the Fuardai driving Maserati, and then also like the sort of dog-eating festivals in Guizhou. You have ghost cities, you know, unpopulated new city structures that people are building out in, in satellite cities of China that no one's moving into. But then you also have sort of overpopulated cities and people being shoved on the subways just to fit in. You get this version of China that, that's only based on the extremes. And what I was seeing and feeling on the ground was, was totally average. And so I became interested in sort of the pedestrian, the everyday, the average of, of what people were thinking, feeling, hearing what the challenges that they felt like they were facing, what their attitudes were towards money, towards advancement, towards ambition, what they wanted for themselves, their family, their country. Because that, that average didn't feel like it was being represented in a way that was approachable. And so it's a mix between qualitative interviews. You know, I, did, I, I traveled through almost every province in China. Um, quantitative research that was secondary, you know, we're, there's a huge amount of research that's done in China that never gets published in English. Uh, and so sifting through that and speaking with the experts who created that, there were, there were in areas that were apolitical enough where, where there were not major risks of bias in, uh, in those areas of research. And then third was anecdotes, you know, taking stories from, you know, I was trying to live in a very intentional and immersive way. It sounds sort of silly, but at the time I was, I was, I was intentionally trying to put myself in, in places and situations where, where I'd just be around young Chinese people away from the major threads of that media was, was covering. And um, it's something that I think you can only really do when you're young. And it's a perspective that I think it's hard to mimic when you're older. And you know, even now, looking back on that, I don't think I could replicate that. And so taking stories that would help bring some of these issues to life 
in, in a way that was human um, was, was the goal of Young China. So each chapter is organized around a different theme rather than a specific person. Um, and then choosing a story um, based on sort of a, a um, many of my own experience and in interviews around the country that would bring that to life in a, in a relatable way for a global readership uh, was the goal. So we covered everything from education, child rearing, um, sex, LGBT, government. I, the government chapter is actually my favorite, um, talking about the ambitions of, of, of a young person who wants to be in government and how that shifted, how that impacts their love life, which, which of course, for any 20 year old, it, you know, the, your ability to, to get married or not, get on a, be on a date or not, get laid or not, is, is, is at the top of your mind and, and how whether or not a certain career path is going to enforce that. Um, consumption, obviously, fun, uh, how, that, how, how China was sort of redefining fun in, in real time for, for this young generation. The basic thesis is that this young generation is the, identi is the identity generation. Um, this young generation often feels trapped between two large tectonic plates. And I think I talked about this a little bit. So Todd, if, if I did flag this to be cut, but this idea that on one, on one side you have modernity, which is the pressures of what it means to be a young person in modern China, real estate prices, urbanizing environment, um, shifting demography. So you no longer have siblings to help support your parents as they age, uh, extended longevity as parents live longer and want more. Um, on the other side, you have tradition, sort of what it's always meant to be Chinese in some, in some murky way, which is this idea of the centrality of family, the importance of getting married um, and having kids, um, the, the want to be selfless and, and sort of look after your parents and, and the conflation of being a good person with being a good son or daughter. Those two tectonic plates often feel like they rub up against each other. And this generation at its, at that fault line between them feels responsible for negotiating how, how those two plates fit together. Because as they do find their resting place at, at this moment of a really serious upheaval, they are redefining what it means to be Chinese and modern, um, in real time. Because a lot of our definitions around what it means to be Chinese, even within China, are based on the past. No longer. This generation is deciding what it means to be Chinese uh, in modernity, you know, today and going into the future. Let our audience know, where can they find your book? Where can they pick up a copy? Yeah, so, so you can get it kind of wherever books are sold. I know that sounds silly, but uh, I obviously try to support your... It, it support your local, your support your local, um, whatever support, wherever you buy books locally, definitely do that. I think bookstores in, in general, uh, you know, they were a safe place for me as a kid and, and to be able to do that, I, which, which includes, by the way, I was recently in touch with my high school librarian and she has told me that the book is consistently checked out, which, which always, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. So you don't need to buy it. If you have a great local library that has it, I totally am understanding and encouraging of that. Um, it's out in Germany. It's coming out in China, which is sort of an interesting conversation around how the changes that they're that they're going to make. Um, it's out in Vietnam, and and so it's it is available um, through whatever trusted trusted book buying source you have uh, at your at your fingertips. So, if you don't mind, obviously you're incredibly knowledgeable about China, but. I'm sure that you have a thirst for more information and to learn more. Who are one other one or two potential guests that you think we could target that people that you like to follow and learn from about China? Who do you think would make great guests on this show? Yeah. So Todd, it's someone that we both know and that's, and that's Ray Ma. Uh, we, we, I, I laugh because we were sort of talking about her beforehand and how we're both big fans of hers. Um, and you know, there's a lot of people as China has become more important to the economy. There's a lot of people who have who have risen out of the woodwork as as China experts and and business experts. And I'm not going to say it's all fluff, but there's a lot of it's increasingly difficult to find the real meat. And and Ray is so smart and so tapped into that world, um, particularly you know in, in business and VC. That I, I think she's the best voice out there that at least I've encountered who can sort of bridge what's happening in China and business with, with the wider world um, in a really like personable and, and accessible way. So I would definitely advocate for, for having Ray on if you haven't already.
There, there's another voice, if I, if I were to add one, and it's a little bit more contentious. Um, there's a man named Parag Khanna. He's based in Singapore. And, and Parag is a demographer. Um, he, he has a lot of sort of interesting and, and somewhat unorthodox ideas. I'm sure he would say they're not unorthodox. He, I know he has a new book coming out. And I, I met Parag in, in the UAE a few years ago. And his ideas, particularly around sort of city clusters and how China's sort of evolving approach to, to city clusters and, and how that's changing human migration and, and economics, I think would be really relevant to China today. And, and specifically, yeah, specifically that sort of how sort of China's demographic future, not in terms of population, but how people are regrouping around, um, around, around city clusters and, and, and China's approach to that. And, and even taking from the Singapore model, I think Parag is a little bit non-traditional demographer who, uh, who, who definitely pokes people and prods people to think in, in different ways. Zach, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. It's been obviously awesome to talk to you, but it's been a pleasure to get to know you. Thanks for coming on the show. Totally my pleasure, Todd. And thanks everyone for listening. I know it's tough times right now. Everyone just keep on keeping on and hopefully, hopefully see everyone soon somewhere in the world. Growing a company is hard. Doing it in a foreign market? Exponentially so. The best piece of advice I can give you is not to do it alone. When you start looking across the pond for further expansion possibilities, and I sincerely hope that you do, make sure you choose the right partners to do it with. My good friends at WPIC Marketing and Technologies have almost 20 years of experience helping brands just like yours enter China. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Negotiation. And if you're interested in being a guest or want to connect with me or any of our team, please reach out to us at podcast at WPIC.co. And be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Zai Jing.